All right. Hey there, everybody. Uh, welcome to Dawn of a New World. This panel here will be us talking about world building, uh, our process behind it, all of the amazing, cool, fun ways that we do it, why we do it, how you can do it, and of course, a live example following. I've gathered some absolutely fantastic minds uh, to uh, just, you know, tell me about their process. Uh, these are all people you've seen PM on uh, TPK or Neon Lights in their own created worlds or uh, own adapted worlds. And uh, I just, you know, if you're like me and you enjoy uh, history, culture, anything about literature novels, I think uh, this is gonna be a great time for you to help uh, dive in the brains. If you have any questions, make sure to throw it in the chat, but uh, I guess to jump us all off. I'll ask everyone to introduce themselves. Uh, I'll start first. Uh, my name is Turk or Turk Accented. Uh, I am a GM uh, player, general nuisance uh, across both GBK, Neon Lights Roleplay, and Nat 20, uh, as well as anywhere else that they can't kick me out of yet, uh, except for that. So that one Costco in <laughs> Ohio is out. Uh, <laughs> but uh, beyond that, my fun facts about my work, the most recent world I've made and the reason I got into world building, uh, unrelated. So the fun fact is that the dragons of my world are considered divine beings because they are, they are fragment. They are like divine guardians of the, uh, divine guardians of the second age who failed and now all other dragons are basically their offspring or like lesser versions they're not true dragons uh and the reason i got into the world building is because i'm a big old history mythology culture nerd who decided to make that everyone else's problem and also the forgotten realms feels so full so playing D, &D there never in, in that setting never really fully got me bit into the way I would want to tell a story because it would be like, oh, this city is doing this thing at this point in time. And I'm like, I don't care. It's on fire. Uh, and it needs to be on fire. I don't care. I don't want to be next to a lake anymore. <laughs> Why are you screaming at me? Sometimes things need to be on fire. Sometimes things need to be on fire, uh -huh. right? So i uh so yeah that's that's me i'm gonna throw it down to foxy we'll go to an end formation hey hey reverse it it's me uh young foxy aka big foxy aka no longer perma banned from twitter foxy uh <laughs> and uh i'm here i hang out over on neon lights roleplay here at tpk roleplay mm -hmm. and uh, i guess i've officially made my debut appearance on nat 20 now too as of last mm -hmm. night so that's i'm just i'm trotting the globe of ttrpg channels so just i'll conquer them all one day catch me on critical role in a couple years anyway um <laughs> Yeah, so I GM, I play, I write, I do all kinds of other cool things. I'm also a SoundCloud rapper, if that matters. It's not for this conversation, but that's a thing. Uh, and a cool fact about the most recent world that I've built, which is the uh, the Lost Lands of Zora in the, my campaign, The Seven Suns, which you can catch on the online Lights roleplay. Um, great shout out timing. Uh, Zora mm -hmm. is this interesting uh, kingdom of sort of, I call it almost necromantic hierarchy, wherein those people who are in power are not just the most powerful but they use a very, very complex weave of, uh, of cursed magic to keep those who, they, who uh, die under their oppression uh, useful to them. They literally uh, effectively brand a slave with a mark that when they die, saps their soul into a gem that they can then use for more power. Uh, and so that's kind of been a, a thing that I, 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 like, I like to talk about a lot in my world as a concept. Um, a side, side fun fact is that one of my players is married to the goddess of death in that world, which is pretty fun. Um, the reason I got into world building was mostly just that I always loved writing and similar to the way that I found poetry, D&D uh, &D and games like it taught me that like the things that I came up with in my head could be things for my other people around me to enjoy and, and get lost in and find something for themselves in. Uh, and I've never played an official D&D &D module e ever. I've never played one. I've, I've, like, I've always just like... Give me the because I mostly because I never had the money for them. I was just like I could get the core rule book maybe and like maybe the GM's guide and that was it. So it was all like even monsters often I had to just make like make up my own monster stat block. So by almost necessity I had to constantly come up with my own worlds by that. And so by then I just found like people enjoyed it and loved it. And so I just kept finding myself forever DMing it. That's all I got. And I guess if we're going an end, that takes it over to my dear lovely friend Tyrant next. 
Hello, everyone. I am Tyrant. Uh, I am a GM, staff member, uh, player, uh, also general nuisance uh, like Turk, and I suppose a homebrewer now uh, for TPK Roleplay. Um, and it's been it's been a lot of fun so far uh, in the realm of home brewing, um, as I have come to uh, realize. Um, interesting fun fact about my world, there's, I mean, I had one and then, uh, heck and Chad actually just brought up another one. That's pretty interesting. Um, the one that I had was, uh, the entire world, um, it was created when, um, the God of the sun and the goddess of the moon, uh, sacrificed themselves to trap the nothing this uh, expansive darkness that didn't allow creation. Um, and so trapped all of them together and now the world. Um, so cool, interesting little thing, a uh, little fun fact there, but also um, last night uh, in the same world uh, for Wrath of the Many, the campaign, uh, mini series that I'm running uh, every other Thursday here on TBK. Um, they, the party, finally made their way to the the seat of power, the capital city of the High Elven Republic, um, and proceeded to burn it to the ground. Um, not themselves, but their actions made it so that this lofty, um, you know, Elven society. Um, their their faults and their, their the bad things that they did uh, they came to light and a revolution was had um, and so there's going to be repercussions coming coming from that uh, it'll be interesting uh, how I got into homebrew uh, or just I guess world building homebrew world building um, is one I was too lazy to read um, everybody else's world stuff um but also that kind of feeds into the fact like i feel like when you are living uh in your own world you it's a lot easier for you to just kind of make it your own um a lot of times especially when it comes to streaming uh, a lot of times the pressure of getting every little detail right that's been already written about a world um can be overwhelming uh, even if it's not necessarily something that you need to do, a lot of people feel like they have to. Um, and so I cut out all of that uh, and I just go pure 100% homebrew because A, it's fun. Let's be realistic. It's it's a fun thing to do. Uh, but B, I just it's easier for me to run a game in my own world as opposed to, you know, Forgotten Realms or something like that. But uh, let's go on to Meg. Hello, I am Meg Mysteria. I have taken over TPK. This is my life now. Good. <laughs> You're welcome, my good gracious overlord. Long live. <laughs> you can Long find me green. on TPK, on Neon Lights. Unfortunately, we're not doing In His Divine Name this weekend because of TPKCon, but it's cool because I am not prepared to deal with the... Shit, what are they called again? Tyranids. The Tyranids. Tyranids. <laughs> it's scary dinosaur bug things. I don't want to deal with them. <laughs> But, um, and as well as on Twitter, my personal Twitch, um, you guys have gotten this whole spiel before. Um, so as far as a fun fact about my home world, like, um, homebrewed worlds is I have not actually been able to run a game where I've had, like, my world made. Um... I have stuff like I have a world that's sitting in my back pocket that I haven't been able to really sh uh, host for anybody. That it's mostly <clears throat> meant to explore the different the. I don't want to. I don't know how to actually perceive this, but it's meant to explore the differences in races and cultures. So, um, and it's mostly supernatural races. You've got elves, gorgons, uh, not gorgons, lamia, 
uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all kind of living in this world that's differentiated, but there's one big capital city where even though it's still segmented, they can all technically live together. And it's supposed to explore the different politics and things going into that. Um, and the reason I start, got into homebrewing was mostly because I I like doing that kind of thing. I like building things from the ground up. I am a writer. I like creating these worlds, these cultures, and things like that, and just drawing from experiences in mythos and real world to do so. Um, <laughs> like I said, uh, <laughs> mostly uh, I have not been able to play like host one of those worlds. I mostly just adjust fire to worlds that already exist. But so th this will be a fun experience, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think you've set the uh, alarm out for a lot of uh, a lot of people already in the chat. Um, so be ready, <laughs> keep those keep those DMs opened. Um, <laughs> hey, uh, unknowingly you should have just shot your shot. But uh, actually, that brings us to a first question. I was actually I know we set this. I was going to say I was going to take this to tie first, but Meg, you kind of brought up uh, where where you kind of start with world building. If we could kind of work in reverse order here. I mean, uh, you, you mentioned the world is built around this idea of a discussion. Is that typically where you start your creation process or is it, uh, or do you find some other spot? Do you, do you come in with the idea kind of as an overarching blanket or is there some other origin point? So the way I typically start it is I come in with an idea, like something that's just a base thing that kicks everything off. So, for example, that one that I was just talking about, the core idea was, okay, what if we have this place that's kind of unique where it's got all these different cultures, but still differentiated. But, um, and from there, it just kind of evolves and takes more and more shape as you think about um, what each of these cultures might, each of these different races, what their cultures might be. Um, what regions they're from and how that shapes how they behave with other races and people. Um, and when it comes to that, I usually try to get like other people's input. Like when I had first started fielding that world, I fielded to a couple of different people that I had been entertaining as players for it uh, to get kind of their input and, okay, what do you think would be really cool to bring into the story what appeals to you as playing like to be a player for because i think it's just as much uh, a player's world as a gm's world so we are going to touch on that yeah. later uh because that is definitely a a big uh topic of discussion and, and yeah, writer's yeah. block yeah definitely <laughs> um so i mean is uh, sorry so i'm checking you got it? You're good? Yeah. All right, cool. Ty. Yeah. What do you, uh, what, where do you start, man? Where, where, where's the pen? Where's the pen drop for you? Listen, it really kind of depends. Um, a lot of times when I'm building out, um, let's say, I, I'm not going to say necessarily homebrew worlds, because uh, a lot of times what I do is, uh, it's, I think it's better to describe it as like homebrew geography or homebrew um uh continents or something like that i'm not entirely sure that um i've really completely built out an entire world before uh because like a lot of the times right uh you you build a landscape for your players to play in um but that chunk of land is not the entire world right, right. so right um i feel like um where i start is typically uh going to be okay this is the idea that i've had for this campaign um and i need to i need to find a thing i need to create a thing for this landscape that is going to be kind of a defining factor of this campaign so for instance um uh if the campaign is going to be based around you know, aberrations and monstrosities. And there's, you know, this 
this outflux of crazy alien creatures that is swarming the lands, how the hell did that happen? Is there a giant fissure that has opened up in the middle of the continent that all of these things are spilling out of? Has asteroid hit the continent or in, has the asteroid hit somewhere off in the sea where there's now a huge crater or something? So big thing, start off, for me at least, is what are the elements that need to be part of this setting because of the campaign? All right. No. Yeah, dude. Uh, and and just to be clear, of course, when we talk about world building, we're not obviously we don't it, that the scale is not always important. Uh, you right. don't have to make the entire world to play a campaign or 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 be tell a story. You just no. general areas. So there's definitely nothing wrong with not having built a full world. I I will say even though I've worked on a very macro level map level, I still don't feel like this is the entire world. I feel like it's just part of it. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh, Foxy. Huh. Where do I start with building an actual world? I guess it really depends on like, well, I guess it doesn't, it doesn't, a couple things, but kind of bouncing on what sort of like, definitely what Meg and Ty uh, similarly said, just like a lot of it depends on theming. Like, what am I, what am I going for here? Like, and that can depend on a lot of factors, like what my players have said they want to play what kind of story I want to tell here, you know, what kind of characters they've built, like that can all play into like the sort of world that I, I build. And we'll talk about that a lot more later, obviously. But when I start with a world, I usually start in one of two places. Um, I took a couple, I used to teach a class on, uh, on, on fiction writing. I mean, I taught a section on, uh, on, sex, on setting building or on world building. I always tell my students, there's two ways to build a fantasy setting right, of any kind. You can do the C.S. Lewis style or the, or the Tolkien style. Uh, effectively, it's build out or build in. Um, C.S. Lewis being, you start off in one spot, and it can be anywhere. You start off the wardrobe, which exits into the forest, right? Or the tavern, which exits into the town, or something like that. And the world is only as much as the players see at that moment. So you start off with just, like, the tavern. Start there. You, you pick, okay, they're starting off in a tavern. We'll figure out where that tavern is. Start off, at, who's in there? What's... What's, what about it? What, what makes them want to leave that tavern? And then once they leave the tavern, you say, okay, well, what town is that tavern in? Who's there? What's happening in that town? Oh, they have, they have a mission to go out into the forest next to the, next to the town? What's in that forest? Who's there? What do they find there? And you constantly find yourself just effectively sketching outward. Uh, and then the opposite, which I find myself doing a lot when I like want to tell a certain story specifically, is sort of the, the Tolkien style, which is you build inward. You have your large world concept, you know, your larger idea already. I want to build a desert world full of city state that have this like this despotic slaver rule, kind of like where Zora started for me, like that first, exactly, you know? And then once you have that larger concept, that larger thing, you say, okay, I want a desert world with city states and like a despotic authoritarian rule, which is pretty much where I started at with Zora, just those three things. Cause that's kind of where I started there. And I said, okay. And then I asked myself every single possible question I could about this place and never shied away from answering it no matter how esoteric or simplistic or nonsensical or irrelevant the question seemed. If you ask yourself a question about that world, if it pops into your head randomly, if at one point you think, how do people get around between towns? Don't just say, oh, I'll figure it out later. No, 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 stop and answer that question for yourself immediately, write it down. And if your first idea doesn't make a lot of sense, then edit it, sketch it around with it. But those questions, those things, those are so, so important because those are the things your players are gonna ask about. And if they say, okay, we're going to the next town. How are we getting there? And you just say, oh, well, you, you, know, you travel for a bit and you show up there. That's cool. That's whatever. But if you say, we well, walk down the street to the, to the, you see this large guy who has a, a host of, of beasts, you know, leashed on, on, on posts here, a couple of raptors, a large T-Rex, and a couple of strange beasts with like, with, mat, with multiple horns. Now your players go, oh crap, people ride dinosaurs here? And that's a whole huge thing you can dig into there. So just pick a, you know, either, either pick a small point, which is direct where your players start off at and build out from there. Or if you're going big picture, start with big picture and ask yourself every single question you can. Do not shy away from any of them. That's usually how I start with world building. All right. Yeah. Um, and, and big shout out to Heck. Yes, dinosaurs will be brought up because dinosaurs are cool. There are always dinosaurs being brought up. Yeah. Um, so I'd say for me, my process is usually like, I want to make a world and I have all this, you know, classic civilization brain and I need to express that again and make it everyone else's problem. <laughs> uh, so what I usually do is I will go to some map generator or look at a coffee stain or something. Um, and uh, 
it, it's you know just just kind of work it out from there uh uh, I, I just typically will use like an online resource to generate a map and I'll scout I'll like uh, back when I was working in an office, I would I used to be able to uh, steal the really big printer paper uh, and hold it up over the screen and sketch out the map and then just kind of take it from there. Uh, and then I just fill it with, I find ways to basically cram in all of the really interesting historical periods and fantasy trope stories that I think are really cool because I am, I just, I just want, I want players to, my goal anytime I am DMing a homebrew game or really any campaign is I want the players to feel immersed. I want them to feel like their actions can change the world. And I want them to feel like this world, like they know the world or don't know the world, depending on where they chose to be from. Like, I need them to have agency, but I'm not going to give them a blank canvas and just say, go paint, whatever. I'm going to give them, you know, like a fill in, like a paint by, uh, like a color by numbers book, which is, you know, you can, they can totally choose to, you know, make Winnie the Pooh yellow with a red shirt, or they can do what, you know, you see on the internet where someone, you know, some, some really gifted teenager will go in and, and turn Winnie the Pooh into a demonic entity. These are all these all should be possibilities in my mind for the worlds I make. Uh, so it's coming in and, and just finding ways to stuff in uh, interesting flashpoints and, and just kind of figuring it out from there. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> I feel like uh, so this actually leads really well because uh, I'm going to kick it over to Foxy with our next question. Uh, where, uh, kind of speaking of inspiration, like you were touching on uh, with Tolkien, uh, which is really good because obviously a lot of his work is inspired by, you know, ancient uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, studies mm -hmm. and, and that hit all of his stuff there. Uh, so what, if any, areas of fiction and history do you find yourself taking the most from uh, or, or referencing to in, in your creative process? If any at all. Okay. You ready for me to get a little spicy? Just sure. a tiny bit, just a tiny little bit. So when it is impossible to separate the concept of a fantasy species, culture, or race from an existing human concept of culture. Every example we have of fantasy cultures in a world, doesn't matter, you can name any author you want, any, any genre you want, any period of history, if someone's written about some fantasy species, whether they were orcs, giants, gargants, cyclopses, barbarians, whatever you want to call them, they were talking about some kind of human to a degree. It, it's inescapable. Most of the time. There's, there's, maybe, there's maybe like... Cyclops or pygmies. Yeah. <laughs> Fair. Pygmy elephants. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but um, you but you but I, but I agree I agree with you I think it's you know it's inseparable that like yeah. the othering of, yeah. of people has been reflected and so in like and exactly like the, the the othering of people is like super super duper important to consider in that because a lot of the classical depictions of other cultures and 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 of other species in fantasy has not been the kindest the fairest or the most accurate to actual representations of human culture so. Mm -hmm. Um, having said that, to answer the question in, in a very roundabout way, and I apologize for the hot take, I had to start from the top there. Um, when I, I draw from a lot of things, typically, uh, I am just the biggest, biggest, biggest nerd for like ancient Hellenic and ancient Egyptian cultures. I think they are just some of the most amazing periods in human history, just talking about the ways that we, we expanded and grew and thought about things and each other differently. I just, there's just some incredible figures there to draw from. It, it it's the kind of period of history where like when you dig back and like le read, you're like, am I reading a fantasy novel? Like all these great generals and incredibly politicians and conniv you know, conniving manipulators, like all those things are just like so interesting to read about. So I draw from those places a lot, but um, I'm also, I'm Maori. I'm, I'm, I'm like by, by cultural descent. So I love to splash the bits of my culture that I can find and draw close to, to just throw them into my world. In particular, the way the Maori view gods as these not very distant figures. They're incredibly potent, powerful, all-knowing things and spirits, but they are incredibly closely intertwined with, and in fact, often very, very mortally bound to people. Gods fall in love with mortals. They marry them, they betray them, they love them, they hate them. Like these are things that gods do. And I don't, 
I don't know, just the idea of like, you know, Pantheon in the sky watching the world and going like, haha, that's cool. Like, that's fine or whatever, but like, get your gods in your worlds more, you know? That's where I draw a lot of cultural inspiration from. But yeah, like, those are places I draw a lot of historical lensing from, but you can draw from anywhere, you know? Oh, certainly. And I think, uh, I, you know, we're going to see that as we yeah. throw it over to Ty. Please. What, what 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 do you steal from? And I I mean steal in the best way because as a, a game designer that I really enjoy, uh, uh, Matt Colville always says, "You're only as good as the things you steal from." Yeah, yeah. Um, listen, <clears throat> and you know these questions are going. A lot of these questions are going to reveal some of my more morbid sensibilities when it comes to world building <laughs> and what I like to see. Um, I like I like apocalypse settings. A lot um and so in terms of what i steal from in uh like history it's a lot of like plague uh a lot of um like mass war but like just crazy amounts like uh for instance uh one world that i built a while back was heavily inspired by um the idea of a no man's land right uh world war one um you know trench warfare and um just how desolate uh the the land in between uh the two sides was um and so building a post-apocalyptic hellscape um of a world uh you have these these bastions of civilization that have somehow been able to rebuild themselves. But outside of that, uh, you have the crazy magically infused monsters that are like the, uh, you know, very, very inspired by um, nuclear mutation and stuff like that. Um, I don't know a, a lot of uh, in terms of fantasy uh, or fiction, I should say, uh, you could say like Fallout uh, would be would be good. A lot of um, a lot of these things have to do with uh, like like I said, the first thing I think about is like what is the defining characteristic of this campaign that's going to make an impact on the world itself. And one of the, because I don't want to talk too much about my current uh, world because it's an ongoing it'll, it'll, campaign. It'll, it'll spoil it. <laughs> it might spoil, spoil a few things. Um, but there was one I, I built uh, a while back where it was this, this idea of the no man's land. Um, and how that came to be is uh, the hoarding of magic and then someone, uh, you know, the gods being these kind of, um non non-present kind of beings um except for a few and the few you know made them hoard magic because it was like this divine stewardship kind of thing um and then you know the evil gods came in and corrupted some of the individuals or told shared the truth of their of you know whatever religion they're they're preaching like Hey, you guys are hoarding all of this magic that could be good for everyone. Blah 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 blah. It set them off on a path of rebellion, revolution. Eventually, these dark rituals came about, ancient magics that uh, tore apart the weave, and created this essentially nuclear explosion that destroyed the world uh, in a cataclysm of magical energy. Um, so very much a lot of a lot of my shit is inspired by devastation uh which is uh now that i'm now that i'm thinking about it it's like oh maybe i should come up with a happy camp <laughs> well but like not to like co-opt your answer ty but like i think that says a lot about like your previous point about like oh i've, I've never built a full world i've built like maybe a continent or two like yeah. when we talk about building a world like if you live in like a village somewhere and like a war happens between two factions that are much larger than your nation on either side and it destroys your entire way of life and now you're left in this desolate wasteland, that yeah. desolate wasteland is your world now. You're never escaping it. Like that's it. There's no outside of that. So yeah. like, the idea of like, again, like talking about asking yourself questions, like that can be so relevant there where it's like the world you build, like how, like how far that world needs to go is a yeah. question. 
you can ask yourself. And if you're I, I, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and like, I do think in, in like an apocalypse setting, apocalypse campaign, whatever you whatever you're doing, um, you know, this is my this is my point of view, and a lot of a lot of the stuff we're talking about today, I, everyone that's watching this should be aware that there is no right way to do these things yeah. right whatever you want to do do it just just do it right that is one um, thing i want to highlight especially yes here. yes exactly these are our experiences these are how we do things but however you do it and whenever or whatever you do is going to be great too yeah um it, to me when i build an apocalypse setting what came before uh doesn't really matter to me uh, because because like Foxy said, this is where we are. This is what we're living in. This is what we're dealing with. Most of the people who are living in this hellscape are not going to give a fuck about what happened, you know, before the cataclysm. Mm -hmm. um, so like history is lost. People have died. Like society has regressed. Uh, has we wouldn't passed. we wouldn't know. We wouldn't know uh, what's going on. And I think a, a great piece of fiction to look at um, that you can actually play is Horizon Zero Dawn. Incredible, uh, incredible kind of depiction of what I'm talking about, where it's this, this mass extinction event, right? And then society progresses. But there are elements of the previous world that remain. You know, these giant robot dinosaurs, there's dinosaurs. Go check it out. Uh, but yeah, my mouth is dry. Meg, on to you. <laughs> what a transition period. Way to cut yourself off. <laughs> I'm in physical pain. You go now. <laughs> Close these blinds, just, shut the world out. Just stop whenever you need to take a drink of water. That's how that works, right? Yes. <laughs> That's when you should jump in. But um, as far as stuff that I kind of take from, uh, a big influence for me ends up being along the same lines as Foxy, I like I tend towards a lot of um, ancient Hellenic culture and the pantheons, things like that. That heavily influences how I end up building um, out the culture and the religion of the world itself. Um, as far as anything else, I am actually more inclined to like Tolkien's method, method of things, where I really like building the entire higher thing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then working into these little points but what if they ask what color your orcs are you have to know why do they eat too many blueberries you gotta know why you have to they're gonna ask why it's the they're region gonna... that they live in and how mm. often they get the sun yeah. mm. Didn't think about that, actually, did you? Your, your <laughs> orcs aren't a, um, divine weapons sent by the gods? No. I'm going to say it now, but it'll probably be a, re a better like question to answer later when we talk about a later question. But just so I, I'm saying now so I don't forget it, like, so people, others can remember. As a question for you, Meg, following up to what you just said, hmm. do you often find, like, when you're kind of taking this Tolkien out of world building, that, like, you yourself, as, like, the designer of this world or whatever, want to ask all these, or, like, you know, have all these answers directly? Or do you find that sometimes it's best to kind of, like, leave some holes that like your players can almost kind of add and say like oh well i think it's this thing and you go okay well it's that thing then um like yeah just a question for it's just you there i feel like there's all i feel like this is kind of the case for every gm is that you're going to have this idea of the world that you want in your head like i feel like that's unavoidable we're all going to have this idealized version that we want to have executed but I really do like keeping these open holes that people can develop things in. Like I mentioned before with my um, world building, I was getting people's inputs about the culture and things like that, what they thought made sense, what they would find appealing. I think that's a really important thing to bring in because otherwise your players are just going to be like, what role do I have in this world? is oh, definitely. kind of my thought in it. And that's maybe where I run into issues with doing modules and things like that. And what I've noticed even with running like the cinematics for Alien mm -hmm. is that with pre-gen characters, you're kind of like, okay, what's, what's my purpose for being here? But um, that's a whole you nother, <laughs> that's a whole nother tangent that I can go down. But um <laughs> No, I think I, 
I, I, I totally understand that. And we will, I promise, even if it is during uh, our, our example of world building, we definitely have to talk about player driven world creation versus, you know, just here's the map kids go play. I've been working on this for three days straight with no sleep. I am God now. Um, you <laughs> if you fuck this up, um, I'm going to be upset with this. <laughs> if you break this one one thing turk before you before you answer sure. i do want to bring up is i do think uh, there's a lot of people saying um like there has to be obvious conflict for adventurers to exist in a world um i don't think that's true at all mm -hmm. um for one you could do an exploration campaign you arrive in a new land right mm -hmm. um two dystopia everything what? looks good why is Every nothing wrong that's what no, i said in well, chat i said if, if it, where do you find why is nothing wrong you ask yeah. why nothing's wrong that's, that's and, exactly that and uh, in the in the elven city that my players burned down last night it was very much a very much a dystopia everything seemed fine because the government was kidnapping and imprisoning everyone that started a ruckus there is so, no war in bossing time yep <laughs> listen i made the connection between between last night's session I... and avatar like heavily right before and i was like oh my god it's 99 percent avatar <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> there's that, nothing that, like, wrong with a that. lot for me like yes. i the the first story i ever wrote i like the first like campaign i ever wrote for friends i i'd written out entirely and i was like all right this is a great a great arc about like the meeting this kingdom and this young prince trying to rise to the occasion while he's challenging this like great plague rising in from a foreign land. And he, then he like, he kind of makes a big mistake and falls on this kind of like long spiral and does some horrible shit and becomes the bad guy. And I'm like, wait, that's Warcraft. Storyline of Warcraft three. <laughs> ah, shit. <laughs> ah, shit. <laughs> yeah. I see that's, that's, that's my, that's my thing right now is when we say you're only as good as the content you steal from it's because every time you have to think of yourself not as i'm repeating this it's you're taking the light of that of that author and putting it through a new lens that's not a motion i wanted to make but it's the one i'm going to continue to make exactly. um and and it's 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 your take on the avatar format and avatar is a fantastically written thing i don't think there's really anyone out there that's going to tell you avatar is a poorly written show and so you like pulling from that content is only going to do you more it's only going to do you favors in the long run um yeah. so to jump in on on my answer here uh i am obviously a big fan of uh of greek and roman uh, especially roman republic-esque history and mythology uh just obviously because it's an incredibly interesting time where the world was somehow more connected yet unexplored i think it's that wonderful combination where we knew the bounds of the world and within that world it where there was danger but of a type but you could also go beyond and there was an unknown element it, it's it's a fascinating point it, it not it's the birth of a lot of things because humanity was uh, giving us a whole lot of leisure time so i do like that period However, I think people eventually get sick when they hear, uh, oh, yes, this area, everyone has Latin-esque names. Uh, and, you know, it's just like, ah, yes, uh, where's Caesar? And it's just like, oh, he's not Caesar. He's a different guy as I shove an ambitious general behind the door. <laughs> um, Stop. No, no, it's, it's okay. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, for the Republic. Uh, <laughs> let's just forget that Star Wars is basically the fall of the Roman Republic. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's it is though. I could I could get a chart and I can tell you exactly how it all matches up. Yeah. No, I it's, I yeah, it's there. So 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 my thing here is my thing. Mm -hmm. I have looked away from that and here's the secret guys. There was a whole bunch of other stuff happening in the world beyond Greece and Rome and it's just as cool. My most interesting conflict uh, area in in uh uh, on this other continent I, that I'm most excited about. Like I have a whole, just like, I have thought the most of. I have a big old, I have two continents that I've kind of made in my world. They're, you know, I can dive in on why there's two continents, but you know, the gods. Uh, very easy way to explain anything. Just ask the Greeks. Um, but uh, on this one continent, I can tell you, it's basically just the Three Kingdoms period of ancient China. Oh my goodness, if you Fantastic have not looked into it, it's just like 
the it's 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 game it's like game of thrones actually happened it yeah. is a hundred percent if if you enjoy game of thrones and you're just like gosh wouldn't it be cool and it's like yeah it did happen it did Even and it beyond happening. that if you want like a great thing to kind of like base like a great fantasy kind of setting on it's not even just like the the world itself but kind of like the theming of everything a lot of the mythology around the like the warring kingdoms period is just like mm -hmm. if you want like just like that dynasty warriors esque image of like this like great impeccable warrior a has like a crowd of like fighters behind him sweeping Dude, through crowds don't, of moves, don't pursue Lu Bu. It's like it's it you is yeah it's all there it's it's it is it is great especially in it in, in not just in the uh more accurate like historical takes on it but the way it was written you know just like there it, it's i would put it uh lupu is the chinese achilles uh and and i think that's uh just like fascinating because it has this completely different cultural set of values than the hellenic period where you know you'll have you know uh Lu Bu is a completely different character, but he fills a very similar archetype of the headstrong, emotion-prone warrior who gets lost in the blood rage. And and I, I think that it's just fantastic that you know. I don't know. Anyway, uh, one of the one of the big one of my, one of the things I'm most excited about in my world uh, for players to eventually someday I don't know probably never uh, explore is this kind of uh, three kingdoms period, and I've I've built them each around different forms uh, of of uh, regency of like the importance of the king, and or, or rather the, the the single autocratic role and and like. Each, the players are going to be able to like kind of pick and choose like do you want to support the uh, constitutional mo constitutional monarchy or the monarchy uh, traditional monarchy or the completely aut autocratic state and i'm kind of trying to portray like there's good guys on all sides just like the throwing of three kingdoms like there's kind of just like a ooh. <laughs> There's just, yeah. Um, but also other fantasy stuff. Of course, Tolkien is a big inspiration, but I find like uh, Game of Thrones and uh, even like Slavic uh, mythology to be really cool. I have uh, three states here that randomly generated very similar names, uh, Klakia, Kelsia, and Karsia. Uh, and I've just decided that that was traditionally one kingdom that got split amongst three brothers and uh, way back in the day. And uh bada bing bada boom now uh there's three different lands and uh, they all speak the same language and have very similar religions but uh and, and i'm sure someone has ambitions to reunite all three but just like the three brothers of slavic uh tradition you're not gonna really be able to do that uh you know and i'll even pull like i'll admit i have a youtube playlist of a bunch of songs um i have a two steps from hell song queen of crows that i've based an entire city now client nation state around that i just think is the coolest fucking shit in the world because like it's yeah the again this is a purely randomly generated piece of land i'm just like well that's a giant river what if there was a city like a la venice style where the streets are all boats and uh the castle is such that uh when you go to it you have to have your 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 little uh raft yacht boat thing uh hoisted up and there's this point in the song where there's like a quiet and then the it really crashes in again and in my head i've just called this the kneel uh where at the at the zenith at the peak of this thing there's a, a built-in drop off so the ship kneels before the queen who has it basically has her own private uh lake at the top of the city and uh it's like colored water it's the ship right um and and she goes and you know if you're invited up there she'll be out on the balcony to see you and then it's like i'm seeing it in my players heads they i you know i'm already kind of like planning a mini campaign where it's like oh yeah they have this trusty boat guy who like is nothing at the beginning and then they help they just keep using him to like get around the city and then he gets to be his guide and like once you enter the water your boat kind of gets stained with that purpley color so you know your boat's special um and just kind of like going from there and just having that having that music hit it's like when the the kneel hits and like anyone who's native that city knows you have to kneel but i'm just seeing of course because i know players are going to be like i don't want to kneel and then that's where i let them know there's a magical effect they have to save against or they are literally physically forced to kneel um 
because the the Queen of Crows don't fuck around. Uh, she has a city to run and independence somehow to uh, uh, enforce. Also, all of her knights are based off of all the really cool illustration work of uh, bird-inspired knights. Um, so, yeah, I've, I really enjoy it. So steal from everything. Steal from yeah. art, steal from music, steal, steal from, from books. Just, just be like, literally, if you can get yourself a Pinterest board somewhere and just like, this is this city, just, just throw... The, throw these pictures there that's the vibe and i guarantee by the end you're gonna have a much easier time making that um though there was a question pearl brought up so i'm gonna stick that in here yes uh and send us back in overlay order yeah. uh, back in the order we came from uh because uh why not um about conflict in your world and does your world need a a, a something terrible to have happened to get people engaged now i will say no but it depends on the system because I think this is really where D and D and and D and D esque systems, especially, almost need almost kind of prescribe a, a before time, because there is a dungeon, there is an ancient civilization, there's a ruin, there's there's untapped magic. You know, the, why is there just a hole in the ground here? Did a hobbit build it? You know, uh, but a fallen kingdom allows you to explore ancient sites where it's not grave robbing because there's no one there to claim it or like you know someone's in you know taken over it or something uh but i just find like it's it's adding to the unknown right. that's why we have cyclops uh because the greeks dug up a giant skeleton with a hole in the side of its head and human-esque teeth and two tusks and I said what the fuck is this thing I hate this. Can it not exist? Except it did. And they said, okay, it's obviously a giant person. Um, or, you know, a a any example of ancient peoples, you know, dragons, unicorns, uh, all these mythological creatures, of course, we'll touch, they'll, they'll touch on it later panel. Uh, definitely go check out not planet earth, but you know, it's, it's just fossil records and before time stuff and trying to make the best explanation that you can. And I, I, I feel like if you're making a D and D world, you have to have some kind of, history to the world just because uh whether that be with your players or without your players input just to have them give them something to sift around in you know they can dig their dig their fingers into the sand and just see how deep it goes uh but that's honestly it, again it depends on the system you can have like an electric bastion lands thing where <laughs> it's always been like this because it's crazy and absurd um i'm gonna throw it over uh Reverse, so let's get Meg. I remembered to unmute myself. <laughs> I am, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I'm kind of in the same boat where I believe that there should be a history to your system. This, Unless you decide to be like, oh, this is literally the dawn of man. But, um, which, you know, that could be a cool take. Maybe you're playing... Uh, as gods who are creating an actual world. But um, if you're doing something that's more grounded, I feel like there should be some kind of history. It doesn't necessarily need to be a messy one. Um, and that's very just dependent on the setting and story you want to tell. I prefer going for stories where you are there for the decline. Mm. That's what I like to base things in. So you start off, you see everything kind of how it is and then you start learning more and more about what's wrong and it just kind of cascades yeah. into chaos and now you're here trying to deal with it yeah i, I feel like conflict <laughs> is certainly central to a story and the collapse of an entire uh, civilization is uh, the collapse of the existing power is definitely a fantastic way to start I think it's really easy to uh, forget that, like, you know, the world's falling apart. Do something about it. Is a fantastic way to jump in. Uh, Ty, uh, I don't necessarily think that there needs to be any sort of collapse or fall or anything. Uh, you can make a you can make a purely um, kind of sunshine and kittens campaign if you'd like. Uh, but there's also, you know you don't give your players that much information and you just let them kind of go out and do whatever they need to do. And then uh, they look around and they're like, okay, 
what is what is the history of this place? You know, eventually they might be interested in that, or you could push them towards that. And they find out that this completely like seemingly fleshed out place that should have a history doesn't have one. Yeah. Why? That's a hook. That's yeah. <laughs> I've done no prep work. Now this is your problem. <laughs> but no, I, I yeah, I, yeah boom. Lazy writing. Because <laughs> <laughs> that, that could jump into a whole thing. Was it like a eugenics yeah. program? Are they trying? Did someone come, do this purposely, or is this like a roadside picnic thing where it just kind of happened? Well, no. I mean, I, my my thought there was like, this is a simulation, right? Or uh, these are. These are lab rats in a Truman Show situation, or um, like you know something like that. House. There doesn't necessarily need to be uh, a fall before the campaign. And I was going to bring up uh, what Meg brought up was you know they could be there for the first fall, um, or there just doesn't have to be a fall because the world that you're living in, I don't know, it's fabricated. Something like that. Yeah. I mean, I'm just getting out of roundhouse brain. You don't have to bring me right back into the simulation, man. <laughs> um, but yeah, Foxy, what's your thought? So I'm going to take this in a synthesized position kind of somewhere in the middle where I, I think you not only don't need to have a background conflict, you also don't need to have history. I don't think your world needs to have history, which doesn't mean there is no history at all. I don't think the history needs to be a thing that matters to your world at all, depending on the kind of story you're want you're telling. And I say that specifically because, uh, and this is almost kind of like a counterpoint to, to Seven Sons, kind of like as the opposite where, uh, of the other world I'm working in, uh, in his Divine Names campaign I'm running, where like the setting for that world already exists. I'm playing it's existing in a, in a universe that exists already, the War of 40K universe, which has plenty of openness for like the for like writer creativity. So like the planet we're fighting over is created myself, the kind of like conflict that's happening is kind of created all myself a lot of the characters that exist here are all kind of created on my own um but that's basically just like uh that's kind of like it's just a sort of setting that already exists but with that i love personally kind of like like meg said like you love placing your your stories kind of like in the downfall kind of have your, having your players experience that i love placing my players at the dawn of history like and i don't mean like literally the dawn of history history i mean like whatever big event you know I could put my players 130 years after the Great War in the aftermath where all the factions are settling in and there's this long history of the Great War that happened. Or I could put them at the start of the Great War when every single faction that's like these big, super important empires that rose up and were like that, that will become these like empires of legend where they're resplendent and talking and, and preparing to fight. And I put my players in right there, you know? And that kind of talks about the idea of, and Vermin mentions this in the chat, the idea of like player GM discovery I like doing that because I don't have to create every super important battle or character or moment that happens. My players can do that. My players can s determine what history they want to see as it's happening. I put them mm. at the head of the Great War, say, all right, what things do you want to experience as this Great War is unfolding? And anything that they pick, I ch then, then I, I get to flesh out. So I, I can... Yeah. I'm going to jump in here just so you can keep riffing because we'll Go. start with you. I have held back the floodwaters as much as I can. I think it's time to officially jump into because uh, Vermin's uh, finally uh, unlocked it, I suppose, with, with, with their question. Um, do you more so try and build the world for your care for your players or with your characters? I, and that that really comes down to, you know, are you are you do you make your world just for the players? Like, I need to know what you all want to do, or are you or are you more of a or do you subscribe to the theory of like, I am going to make the world, and then you are going to tell me where you are most interested, and then you can help fill in the gaps that I have because I haven't slept in three days because <laughs> there's a whole lot of detail. Uh, and the question of whether I build my my worlds for or with my players, with always with, no question, no no exception, always with, uh, to the point where like I don't even bother hardcore fleshing out like like when i build a setting for example I'll, I'll go back to zora for seven sons again i built the sort of the, the 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 place the continent or the country as it were of zora as an existing place and then i and then i basically stopped and i said all right i don't care what world exists outside of this i'm not gonna flesh out any of that instead 
I'm going to ask my players, hey, who are you? What species are you? What culture are you? Where is your, your, your character from? And based on that, I'll build a world that reflects that. So as an example, I built a world that was meant to be kind of like a playground for one shot. I think I only ever did one one shot in it, but I was kind of working with the idea of like, there having been this great war between multiple different people and cultures on different sides of all sides were like effectively one larger war that had about four or five different micro wars going on in the background of it. That just like a massive scale conflict that kind of like settled in to a tentative peace. And so all I had really besides like the map of the world they could explore and like that sort of idea of like there had been a war was just emptiness. And then I told, I said, okay guys, what species are you playing? I have an idea of a, of a couple species. Like I have an idea of where dwarves are. I have an idea of where orcs are. I have an idea of where elves are. What are you guys playing? And where do you want them to be? Are you playing a, a snake person? Oh, okay, well, where, where, are they, where are they from? Are they from the deserts? Are they, where are they like? like what are, what, what's, the, what's their culture? I ask my players all these things. And then we work together to build that. And I, 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 I kind of like find the ideas that they want and fit them into my larger campaign narrative. And that, that's, that's where you can create all kinds of fun things with that. Like, you can say, for example, oh, okay, well, you over there want to be from the serpent people culture and you're from the uh, cat people culture and you guys are both from the deserts and you have sort of separate goals. Okay, well, guess what? Your two factions fought separately during that war. You had a huge war that fell out. Your cultures hate each other. And now I've created a setting where my two players can now create a background where, okay, do we hate each other? Do we have like certain like biases based on like our, this, this, this history? We've created all that on our own organically. I didn't prerequisite or create any of that. I just said, all right, here's this sort of world I have. Where are you? Where are you? Here's an idea I have. Do you want to run with that? And that's how I build every world of mine. Everything that I do is just like open concept. What do my players want? And once they give me some pitches, some pitches here, I, I write down some, some, some ideas, some sketches, and I say, okay, I thought this, what do you want? And I, I go from there. I always build my worlds with my players first and foremost. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't have a quip to add on to that. Um, <laughs> other than dang those snake people, they started it. Uh, <laughs> the, the war of reptilian aggression will not be forgotten. Uh, <laughs> throw it over to Ty. Uh, for me, it's very much, um, it's in the same vein, broad strokes, and then let the players fill in the minutia. Um, I would say more so in, uh, you know, there's a continuous ongoing development of the world as we progress through the sessions and the campaign itself. Um, I don't, I listen, I have in the past tried to flesh out every single detail I possibly could, including like shops, names of shop owners, their families, like what they do in the town when they're not working, uh, like blah, 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 hardy har. Um, and I just find that's very time consuming and more often than not doesn't even come up. Um, and so what I've, what I've come to just kind of start to do is if I need a specific uh, section of a town or a city to be fleshed out for, you know, a part of a mission or, you know, a sp specific arc of the campaign or whatever then i will do more work on that but um in in the world uh, i will have these kind of like switches that i can switch on and off for different places so if we're in a you know a poor town that town's not going to have a lot of the resources uh that a major metropolitan city will have and so if the players go asking around for like a magic shop or something they're probably not going to find it in that small town. They may find with a really good role, someone who's like got a yard sale or something that's selling like their family heirlooms. Cause they're, you know, like they, they can't eat. Um, but if they go to a larger city, then it's like, yeah, yeah, there's this thing. It's really easy to find. Like, let's, let's talk about this together. And it's really easy. I think to, uh, to get into the headspace of like, oh, you need to have this fleshed out so that when your characters go there uh, and they want to experience this, you know, you can you can do that. But I challenge a lot of world builders who are you know in this call listening um, to roll more with the punches uh, that your players give you 
than uh, making something just kind of set. Uh, obviously, you may need it for something specific, but if you are um, going through a town and doing all this and that, have like a fantasy shop name generator next to you or a name generator next to you. If you don't trust yourself to think of something off the top of the dome immediately, um, then have have those lists where you can just go like, oh, okay, it's this person's name, this type of shop, the name of the shop, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then just just run with it. Another way to go about it, and just like, it's like if you like, if you need like an honest bribe bit of motivation, especially for like some like shop names or like a person's like physical descriptions and like that, ask your players on the spot. Just like if they walk up, oh, what's the name of this potion shop? I don't know. What is the name? <laughs> just ask them. Like, and I, I've learned to do, I do this more and more with my players these days, and I'm learning that it's, it's only yielded good results. Just let your players do it sometimes. Like, it's their world too. And, and like, there's nothing wrong with just like letting them come up with a random thing and then you spitballing off of that. Like, and it's, this happens all the time, I find even. Like, if you think about it, it's kind of how backstory works. You come up with a base concept, a thing that you want put in the world, and your GM spins off of it. Just do that in the moment. If you want the 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 blacksmith shop to be named like War Bear, and like just let the GM run with that, and let the GM come up with a reason why it's called that. Maybe the guy behind it has a big old bear shoulder on his pelt, like on on, on his shoulder from like a, a thing he killed when he was a kid. I don't know any of that. Like maybe his dad was a mercenary named the War Bear. Like you could go with any of that stuff, but like just let your players just do that. Like of course, let your players take it in the moment and they'll come up with all kinds of stuff you can just run with. It's really fun. Of course. Sorry. I I, I blacked out for a minute when Chiron said he challenged me and my brain just <laughs> did the Kill Bill sound effect. Right. Um, how dare you, sir? How dare you challenge me? I will have all the details planned down to the minutiae of the pocket change. <laughs> The lint in this region is blue. You know why? <laughs> uh, uh, well, yeah, but uh, very blue jeans. Uh, <laughs> but I'm gonna throw it over to Meg. Tell us your secrets. Um, I feel like you've already given us a hint, but you know. I, I kind of have given you guys a hint more, as please. far as um, like actual homebrewing old world goes. I try to very much, like uh, Ty mentioned, Broad strokes, I build something that I have a base idea of what I want to be, and I build a lot of the culture and things like that, because and let um, my players talk with me to help develop that. Um, like I said, my homebrew world has never seen the light of day, but uh, I also think that it really just depends on setting and what you're doing, because I've also run games where it's been set in a specific world like i literally ran a game that was smack in the middle of the raccoon city incident and that's very kind of structured like you have a setup you kind of know what's going on even if you do your own story with it there's key places there it's got a whole setup over the course of three or four games so <laughs> that's its own thing but as far as homebrew goes, yes, I believe in uh, working with your players to actually develop some of that world. Um, I, I'm with Turk in the I am kind of obsessive about little things. I will. <laughs> yeah, man. Because here, here, here's the approach I take. I'm not making a world to, you know make an adventure in it that's not my mindset i make my world like a setting guide get that right? I, i'm i'm basically yeah. just writing a history book in yeah, my head true. um and i intend because again one of the things i really liked about dnd as a concept is you can go into these places that feel well tread and players can recognize things that maybe even they've done so in a way i am working with the players like, I, I like, you know, throw them in during interesting times and let them resolve issues, throw them in at different ends of the world and see how they might inevitably end up impacting one another. Mm. Uh, that was the whole idea uh, when I initially kind of started some of the one shots of Winterhold's Finest and uh, His Majesty's uh, Most Loyal Resistance. Uh, it's just those one shots in the same world where you can kind of get the gist of each other and like the players seem like, oh, I recognize that thing. You know, yo, Angelo, um, kind of like if you build a history to your world 
and uh, through through the campaign and uh, run different adventures and see how they fit. I mean, sometimes that's how I will populate one of my older ones when before I got frustrated with it and just decided to scrap the whole world, except to still save my hard drive because never throw any away. Um, <laughs> uh, was to basically like look at a few one shots that I really liked and figure out how I'm going to fit this into my world. You know, how, how does the uh, wolves of Gwenton figure out into all of this? Where is that, where is that geographically on this map that I've made? Who is it under, you know, how do I connect all of these uh, one shots that will level my players up in a way I want and uh, make it a campaign, um, which I, I think find really cool. But also I just really like, writing history stuff and uh i don't have a problem with players coming in and being like i want to be different and i'm like sure uh i had i had players um i had a player who in uh character creation was like hey i want to be uh tabaxi and i'm like okay just so you know this is going to take place in this part of the world and your people were the evil empire that would come in and basically be the Aztec empire where they moved in with a more advanced uh, technology than everyone else, did a bunch of blood sacrifices. People would basically disappear and KVD style into the night. And then one day all of your enforcers basically just left and you haven't been seen since. So people might think you're a literal demon if you have to reveal your face, but if you're committed to it, I think it's gonna be a really cool story. Um, and you know, I don't know. I think uh, I think both methods are completely valid. I love I like I think purple said my process generally pretty well is I will paint some broad strokes in areas and if a player wants to be from there, I'm like, perfect. What's it like there? Tell me all about it. You know, yep. here's some general facts about the area that I have worked out. Help me fill in the minutia and uh work with them there but sometimes like you know you as gm i have an idea for this place i like this idea don't 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 ruin my idea <laughs> don't touch that's it's the mine. whole idealization versus what mm -hmm. people want out of it <laughs> yeah and 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 you know i feel i hope at least uh that the historically interesting periods of history and and fiction that i'm stealing from will entertain my players and, and give them you know giving them choices and things like that will will, will satisfy the little loot goblins yeah, so uh that are adventurous me so i just i don't expect any of that anymore i just i don't expect any any creation of mine to survive contact with my players so i just i just got go and just very light just like all right this is my baby and they're gonna sacrifice it but that's okay <laughs> i agree I'll, with you i'll just but, have to live with it Here's but, here's what you have to do, then, Foxy. If your players are steamrolling all of your shit, give them something too hard or too cute. Speaking of which, catch seven suns tomorrow. Oh no! <laughs> well, with that bit of uh, just absolute threat, um, <laughs> I think we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll be uh, helping populate this fantastic uh, little randomly generated world, as well as talking about some uh, cool tools that we've used and. Uh, some extra fun facts uh, as we kind of go around uh, British Bake Off style uh, doing all of our cool stuff. So be sure to check in. Uh, we'll be back very shortly. Uh, thank you all so much for the questions and uh, we hope you've been enjoying this far and see you later. All right, buddy. Welcome back. Uh, <laughs> you can't leave. You can't escape chat. We're here again. Uh, it's too wonderful. Um, this is and your home now. This is your home now. And and speaking of your home now, we've got ourselves a wonderfully randomly generated map. I am a big fan of and have continued to use Asgard's Fantasy Map Generator. Uh, absolutely fantastic uh, website. Um, that's A-Z-G-A-A-R, not Asgar, but you know, you'd be forgiven for the mistake. Uh, where it can basically generate an entire world in as much detail or minutia, uh, in as much detail and minutia as you want. Um, and it's great, man. It's just like, ah, uh, it, it's, it's really been able to, uh, push, uh, a bunch of, uh, a bunch of detail down to individual city names, pathways, uh, culture breakdowns religion breakdowns you can change and play around with the names uh but what we're gonna do here is we've generated some geography we're just gonna jump in and uh let everyone get the juices cooking and i guess uh we're gonna also chat a little bit more we're gonna answer some more questions uh 
So I guess, but we'll start, like I said, we'll do this kind of British Bake Off style. So I'm inviting you all to, of course, begin working, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to peck at Meg first. Meg, what's, uh, what's your first thoughts getting in and looking at this? Uh, my first thoughts getting in and looking at it is probably focusing more on like trade routes and port towns between all these outlying islands in the peninsula. So I'm thinking, hold on, let me, where, where's my draw tool? Something, uh, probably. Also, I want to apologize ahead of time if anyone hears any singing. My landlord is painting my house. He's got the voice of an angel. Like about here. He sounds like a cool dude. He's a really nice guy. He sings a lot, though. Nice? Landlord? Impossible. Crazy. He lives across the street. That's the secret. <laughs> All right. I see your mark. My little pink dots here. My oh, ideas. Pink dot. Yeah, some... I, see, I see your thought process here, like kind of like thinking out like, this is a thing I do often too, like when I'm kind of placing initial markers, thinking about like logistically, like where cities would form, like naturally, because like cities don't just pop up out of nowhere. It's just like, oh, hey, boom, city here, let's do it. Exactly. Like, mm -hmm. you know, they form as the natural result of like people coming together around certain like farmlands or resources or trade or things like that. So like, and like ports are a great example of that. A lot of the early cities in, in history form around like riverbeds and places well, where it can happen. And and here's the, here's the thing that I really enjoy, uh, and now I, I have to often challenge myself because I do fall and I do go in that same mental way of like, of course, well, of course, the largest city is going to be focused around mm -hmm. river opening to get the fresh water and access to the sea for trade routes. Uh, we it's a fantasy world, however, though, you know. Yeah, it, that's it, true. there is there can be. Uh, I actually I have a race that is centered itself on the top of a mountain because they're the only ones that survived the massive flooding. Oh yeah. Uh, and it's just like, they, then they're afraid to come back down. There you go, there's your, there's your uh, mountaintop. <laughs> but, it, but it's magic. Yeah, see, exactly, the Bala can live up there. Um, they're a bunch of really cool people. They are very uh, religious, but you know, when God tells you to go to a mountain, we're gonna flood, the, we're gonna flood this motherfucker and then they do it. You're like, oh, okay, maybe, you maybe, maybe they're real. Um, but you know, it's a it's a fun little thing um but yeah uh so i guess now i'm going to jump over to ty uh what what are you what are you thinking about and again if you guys uh you guys feel free to keep working it as uh i'm going to also jump in here so when i looked at this map at first um the thing that popped into my head uh was like i understand that this is supposed to be this kind of white blob here in the middle of this landmass is supposed to be mountainous terrain. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think it is. I think this is a patch of ice, snow, water um, <laughs> that, has, that has appeared. Um, and all of the brown and yellow terrain around it is desert. Hmm. Uh, and <laughs> the reason for this is that there is something here that is sucking all of the moisture from the surrounding areas uh, into this kind of condensed, congealed <laughs> spot. Um, and to that effect... Uh, all of these rivers here that we see actually are flowing inward instead of to the sea. Ooh. Interesting. Like and so what we can do, and again, because we have the geography lightly defined here, you can totally extend those rivers to be uh, flowing inward. Yeah, let's do um, that. Yeah. Uh, so definitely take, take that blue tool and uh, go in. So, uh, all right, Foxy. I notice you've marked there's a dead god here. <laughs> yeah. It's a so bold statement. I when I start with worlds, I love to think about uh like as these lands get discovered slash like, you know, like settled, what stories are being told about them? What stories are being told about how this land formed, about you know, what creation myths exist here? And the fun thing about and I think Turk, this is the great thing, is like when we think about traditional like cultures, there's often a matter of like, okay. 
what phenomena had to be explained by the people around here that led them to make certain creation myths and that's kind of like a more realistic approach to like how those th stories form but like turk just said this is a fantasy world you can do whatever you want some of those thoughts and stories can be as wild as you want to be some of them can even be true so i like the idea of like okay so we have this larger landmass here in the center and then spreading out there's this like larger ar archipelago peninsula of islands all around it that if you look just like thinking geographically the distance between those waters seems entirely too um <clears throat> too close for this to have been like the kind of like te tectonic movement that would have taken place over like millions of years so either this world is very very new and these sort of plates are still shifting which is one way to explain it but i thought a more fun way is something violently shattered this land here and spread these islands around here and i was like okay well what's you know you could go to the tie route and just say giant fucking meteor but i was like you know let's go even harder than that so i thought at some point in the in the lead up to this and this is just one of the stories here and maybe no one even knows this is true or not there was some great war amongst the gods for whatever reason maybe no one even knows why one of them was struck down mortally wounded and crashed down into the world clipping the continent as it did so and in the result created this kind of like archipelago of islands and i even marked off one of these small little islands here is kind of like it's like this god's like finger like sticking out above above like the water line you know from its dead resting place and i just i don't know i i love to think about huge level things like that when i first tackle a world because those are the kind of things where like you can build a million different questions and answers about that you know because now at this point i could if i was building this world myself i could say all right well we got three big islands here each of them have a different thought on what different god crash landed here and like it's buried beneath the oceans and that and that infers like their culture and their beliefs and what festivals they have and what what holidays they they follow i can infer all of that just out of this big crazy decision of there's a god buried in, you know like in the um, under the ocean here you know you can play around with that a whole lot you know yeah that's, that's, that's kind of like, like that was my initial lens when I, I just i saw like mess of islands and i was like what can we find as a fun like rather than the typical like plate tectonic explanation for this what's another fun way to go about this i was like yeah you know a, a god crash landed why not let's go with that i mean yeah i i think it's i think it's fun to to see foxy come up with this uh to me coming into this panel i knew foxy was going to uh, talk about creation mythos and so i was like okay i'm going to talk about other things because i i know he's going to talk about it and so i don't want to double up too much um but like i do i do think a uh, lot of a lot of worlds um you know how are these worlds created and why is their creation the way they are now um so creation mythos whether it is through gods deities divine powers or not um is is important in some regards especially if you're um not doing cataclysm <laughs> uh campaigns right so if you're if your world is intended to be lived in how has the creation of this world affected um all of the different elements of it exactly yeah. uh so what I'm doing here is is something I, I like from a top down level is I, I kind of compartmentalize the world. You're marking out nations. I'm, I'm marking out borders, rough areas. See, here's the thing: borders don't necessarily have to be kingdom to kingdom. Sure. We could mark this this area with the with the weird moisture as just kind of a, everyone's agreed it's real hard to live here, so no one's going to try and claim it. Mm -hmm. Kind of area, though I do see the green and I do think verdant land, and I'm I'm feeling like though it's really uh, those areas are, are just like the best farming areas. So oh, see, I saw that and I thought jungle. I went, I, that was I went, I that's that my deep green is my jungle. Yeah. That's where fair. with like the deep green color and, and like that. So there's a whole bunch of land here that is the very deep jungle. And, and then the green is, is the kind of more fertile, almost honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm getting out like a, uh, Oh gosh, uh, like like a Southeast Asian kind of vibe where there's a lot of jungle, and then it will just kind of become you know, like yeah. it definitely like the the deeper green is like to me jungle swampy, mm. uh, whereas the like middle green is all forest, and then everything that's in light green is like that farmland plains yeah, land. Yeah, I can do that. Like high like, like great. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get. I got you. I get. I see yeah. that. I see that. 
So, so I have to, I have to ask, we had some other questions I wanted to get to, I don't, I'll throw them in now. Um, so uh, typically, obviously this is, this is not, you don't typically get to make the world by committee, but there are systems out there uh, that certainly allow for a version of that. I was curious if, if anyone's tried that, uh, if anyone has used that successfully, because I know two of you have, mm-hmm. uh, not going anyone out, but, uh, and, uh, just uh, curious on uh, on your thoughts on, on those systems, and if you've in, been interested or looked into any others, if you haven't used them. Yeah, uh, uh, so I have experience with one system like this, only because I got to play test it and then use it later for a thing on my own. Uh, TPK's own proper nerdy has a, a little game he whipped up, which like, he hit me up on the concept of, and like I saw him work it out. Uh, it's called Generational. It is a game about like it's a story about storytelling, where basically effectively you just take turns in a circle and kind of create a timeline like a, a story for like a, a timeline for a world almost and uh running through the places of that was just so fun and we didn't even use like our places thing as like a setup for a, a campaign or anything it was just like a couple of friends hanging out creating a world for fun and we got some incredible stories out of it and i was like all right i want to see what what's the sort of like fine razor point of this so to follow up uh we got a goofy concept to use a fun supplement that turns a dd fifth edition into like the naruto universe over on Neon Lights, and so we wanted to run a, uh, run something with that, but we were like, you know what? The Naruto world as is is kind of fun, but it kind of killed its own world building eventually halfway through. Um, so we decided to complete to use, uh, while playing Generational, uh, completely rewrite the Naruto universe. We kept all the, we kind of agreed on all the core mechanics of like what things would still exist from like the core canon universe, and then everything else we just let our, our players collectively throw out concepts and write, and the world we've created has like, resulted in something that I think create has more depth than any of us could have done individually. Like everywhere you look in our world, there's a bit of nuance because someone threw out a pitch in that generational that someone else then went and said, oh wait, that's a cool idea. We can do that with that. And that just results in like a lot of really, really fun building. So I don't know, my experience, I, I think maybe going forward, I might like always play things like that when it comes to world building. If I'm not starting with like a, a core world content that I already have, I might from now on just like have my players like play some variation of a game like that where we kind of create our world together. I don't know. I think it just it results in like again, a world that has much more depth than I think and any any individual's world could. Yeah. No and, and, and you know, uh, people often say, Oh, too many cooks, it's you know. I disagree. I think uh, it's a great way to be, to as we were talking about with player interest and like how to get them engaged is make help them make the world and they will care about the world because they will they'll do that human thing where oh it's so cute and new i must protect it at all costs and then they'll want to be heroes exactly and like too many cooks is a thing if you're all cooking at the same time it's not if everyone's bringing their own dish which is exactly what's happening in this scenario this is not everyone trying to cook in the same pot this is everyone having their dish their thing their idea their kernel of this world they're like oh i want to bring this to this party and then everyone's got that. And then the reality comes when you kind of go back and forth, or you pick and say, oh, well, you know what? That that dip you made, it goes super great on that sandwich that Ty made over there. So what if we could take that concept that he had and we blend that with the idea that you had and we make those two things work together. And when, you, when you're willing to do that, when you're not just saying, it's my idea, it's my thing, it's my kernel, when you're willing to say, well, you know what? The idea that, I don't know, that Turk threw out a couple minutes ago actually blends really well into the idea that I had. I think we could say that the thing that I said earlier blends, it, like you know, leads into that or, feeds off of that or they're, they're connected somehow willing to again collaboratively story tell you're not just everyone telling a story on their own that you're all saying at the same time you're telling one story collaboratively but everyone's bringing their own kernel there so it's not a not a, it's not a too many cooks problem it's everyone brings their own dish and you kind of just figure out what mixes well you know i think that's that's a that, that, that's like that's the way you should see that analogy i feel like for like which is why i agree with you Turk. like it's not a too, not too a too many cooks problem because it's not cooking it's like everyone's already made their thing they're just bringing it here you know mm-hmm. yeah no I, I, exactly um and, and i think another version of that uh ty if would you be willing to speak about the quiet year yeah so i for um so i obviously did some world building myself for uh the campaign the mini series that i am running uh wrath for many uh, but the starting area, the uh, village and valley that the first episode resides in, 
uh, before the campaign started, I had uh, all of my players get together for a session zero, and we played through uh, a modified version of The Quiet Here, which is a great map building game. It's a game specifically designed for map building, um, where you go through an entire year, so 52 turns, um, uh, which are essentially weeks, where crazy things happen, and you are given... Uh, choices to make decisions or you can uh, discover new things about the land or start projects like let's say you discovered this crazy uh, route or rock outcropping that you know is completely different from the surrounding landscape you can start a new project to go and investigate those rocks and then eventually uh, after a few turns you get to decide what is going on with those rocks? So it's really cool to give, um, you know, everyone who's playing the game agency over like smaller decisions that are happening throughout this uh, established landscape. So it's, it's really cool. It's like a um, kind of the base of the game is uh, trying to find a way to survive the um, kind of apocalyptic winter that is coming. And so you are, you are starting in a certain, certain way. Um, or I shouldn't say apocalyptic winter. I should say like the apocalypse. Um, so you're starting in a certain way and you're trying to build up these resources and um, narratively figure out a solution to protect yourselves from this cataclysm. Um, so it was really cool, this being, Wrath of the Mini being this, uh, you know, game based off of the apocalypse and cataclysm to kind of integrate that aspect of collaborative storytelling and being able to get everyone kind of um, more involved in and uh, kind of connected to their, their village that they were starting on, because they had created it. They had been the creators of this village, and so when it was ultimately destroyed in the first episode, um, they, I feel like they all took it uh, a lot, lot harder. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a hell of a way to start off a campaign with uh, everyone's, everyone you cared about is dead. Now move on. Yeah. Um, so, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately the, and I would say um, if I was going to run another mini series, I don't know if I would do it in an apocalypse setting because a lot of the a lot of the good content that can come out of an apocalypse is how it affects the people that are living in it. Um, so you know you may be trying to subvert the apocalypse or you know fix whatever happened, but the real story there is how everything is affected uh, moving forward. Um, so. Only having four episodes for a campaign like that is challenging, to say the least, because um, it, it sometimes feels a little uh, death marchy. Um, mm -hmm. But I think uh, I think the players are having fun. So. Yeah, I mean, from what I've heard, everyone's uh, having a absolutely fantastic time. Uh, so before we get to Megan and myself's answer. Um, which is not good grammar, but you know, fuck it. <laughs> uh, I was curious if we could just check in with everyone uh, about what you've been, what you've been up to, because obviously this map has developed someone. I feel we have a bit more of a story building off of uh, this this dead god uh, with the, with its hand reaching out. We we now uh, I'm not sure who put the shattered sea element there. Uh, that was me. Fantastic. Yeah. So in my head, I mean, we could we could almost now make it. There was a, a again. Here's, here's another fun fact about mythology and history. It could all be made up. This doesn't have to be the hard truth of the world. This could just be the belief of one people that there was a battle here between yep. a god and a titan, and uh, that giant chunk of ice is something that I've added on. G giant chunk of ice is the titan's heart that was ripped out by the god in a final burst of energy and chucked to the landmass next to it uh, as they both fell, um, and. Uh, Bada bing, bada boom. Uh, now we have three different uh, geographical locations and a you know world building event that could buy into whole religions. Is there a group of people that thinks that God can be brought back? You know, is there a group of people that we need to keep? You know, this water can't be touched, or to wake up the God who is actually evil. You yeah. know, 
there's probably a group of people that see this uh, shattered elemental ice titan as the defender of their world and these alien gods coming and and killing their defender but uh like uh you know foxy saying here there's the dead god there as well so maybe it was a kind of um fatal blow fatal blow scenario yeah who's you yeah. bring one back who's yeah, just, there's, yeah a, there's a lot who's... of really fun nuance there like that's kind of like what i was saying like earlier is like you leave that you start with that one big thing and there's a million questions you can spiral out from from there mm -hmm. and like i think the most fun thing happens where it's like it's kind of like when you're writing a poem almost honestly like my, my mentor used to tell me like when you're writing don't edit like don't edit while you're writing just get every line you have in your head out worry about what sounds good what makes sense later just get it all out because sometimes that line you got out, you're like, that sounds dumb. Like, that's horrible. Like, a few lines later, you're like, wait, actually, in contextual line, that sounds pretty good, actually. I think it makes sense. So, like, mm -hmm. the idea of, like, we're all kind of, like, running around, like, throwing out names of, like, places. And, like, someone threw out Kingdom of Man, which I thought was so weird. Because, like, it's different than, like, the other two names. Kind of, like, Confederacy of RL, you know, the Assyrian Republic. And then, like, Kingdom of Man. And, like, that's a big different thing. And that's the kind of thing you might go, like, oh, I'll find a better name for that later. But... I kind of added a note, like, I that. love the idea that the human, like, the human race might be so arrogant, they just name their, like, kingdom, just kingdom of man. Like, that's, that's it. Like, everyone it else could... has some other, like, big thematic mm -hmm. thing why they name the kingdom, but the, the humans are just like, nah, we're so great, we named our kingdom after us, actually. <laughs> like, and that's, again, that's the kind of thing where, like, you, you think that, you're like, wait a minute, well, now I've built, like, a character I could possibly, like, lens the human kingdom here, you know? Like, there's a whole bunch of stuff you can do with that, where yeah. it was, like, Sometimes when you spitball certain things, don't just like throw them out and then go, oh, that's bad. I'll do other things else later with that. Leave it there. Let it sit for a minute and then come at it later when you have some like, when you've kind of fleshed it out more because you might actually find that like that bit, like that kernel you threw out has some something there, which I, I don't know. I, mm. That's kind of a thing I enjoyed a lot. No, definitely. And, you know, it could also, as Purpose pointing out, just be, you know, the origin of the name human is because there was some someone out there named man and yeah. it started the race. Um, <laughs> but uh, Meg... He what are you doing? Tired. Haven't heard from you a bunch. I know you've been on three panels thus far, but I'm telling you, are getting tired now? Uh, look, I am thriving. I'm just over here trying to Hell, make sure all yes. your guys' hard work is getting showcased. Um, no, we want to know about your hard work. Tell me about it. What I'm are you up to? I'm mostly just going through and kind of thinking about, like, okay, if we're thinking about these regions as particular things, such as, okay, we're thinking about how the dark uh darker greens more like jungle and the slider green is more like the fertile lands okay what happened why is there jungle and then just desert what happened here um whether and just poking at different things like if this is the heart of the titan it's probably and it's really just falling down into a pit of ice essentially would that be where they send people that are being banished or outcasted as maybe at sacrifices to try to appease it or um, things like that. And you can see a lot of uh, minds mostly just uh, questions and things like that. Um, talking about how the these darker lands, these islands down here, like, okay, these are mostly forests. There's not a lot of room for human population could be mostly animal life it could be isolated cultures um and segues colonists maybe and we're looking at this whole thing with the dead god what if this is just kind of considered sacred water mm -hmm. and they're skirting around the outside of it to do all their trades Yep. Yeah, no, that, that was, was my thing, yeah, marking out the border there. I'm like, it would make sense if there was an island nation with a powerful navy or something, they would want to claim those inner islands mm -hmm. uh, and have a, a clear way into the uh, the mainland, so to speak. But like, if that is holy place, mm -hmm. if that is sink or sack to sail, yeah. I'm touching it, they're not going to claim it. That would be, but you know, if you want to talk about potential conflict, maybe there is someone who feels like it's only natural we expand our borders. We are the most devout people, and therefore we are allowed to claim that God's land is our own. Yeah. We're the only ones who properly venerate the God of the God of fertility that sacrificed themselves uh, for us all those years ago. We were there. We were their most loyal warriors. Thus, why we were placed here at at their feet. Um, 
and you know you just spiral off into that everyone loves a good uh good uh crazy religious person a fanatic yeah. gotta love uh, it Herbert, yeah. Herbert pirate can kingdom. really solid character <laughs> motivation you know especially if it's taken seriously like there's a lot of really Ooh. fun things you do <laughs> i love that the pirates living on the island spitting in the face of the god <laughs> literally in their eyes and no one can pursue them in it's there's stuck. this there's this patch of water that's no like uh a authority figure holds dominion over why wouldn't there be a pirate kingdom that like raids from that water out and then when the authorities try to chase them into the waters they can't go i mean you know? i even that, but... i didn't think of like as a counterpoint to that that would probably be i mean if you're thinking like t typical fantasy world to like to, again just to use terms that are familiar and obviously they might be different like thematically here but like to use terms that are familiar to us there's a god and some sacred water it's probably a paladin order, which probably like thinks that water is super important to protect and guard and probably has a stupidly huge navy. So I'm like, holy fuck, like naval paladins now? So I'm like, yeah, I'm man. just thinking like, okay, so imagine like paladins, but rather than like your typical like knights in shining armor thematic, they're like sailors. They're people who live their lives on the water, on boats, patrolling this sacred water and keeping it safe from threats. Like, and that's like, that's their devotion. That's their cause. And so like, now you have this cool conflict where it's like you have on one side this pirate kingdom who are like, okay, no authorities here. We'll do what the fuck we want. On the other side, you have this like zealous religious order who are patrolling these waters to keep it safe and and sacred. That's conflict. You can put an entire campaign there. Mm -hmm. Like You got to get that uh, holy god bathwater. All right. Uh, exactly. how, how about a hot take? I'm going to flip this all on its head. Ooh, all right. Uh, what about do it, do it. if uh, this island or this little gathering of islands here. People had already colonized it. Maybe it was a branch off of some of these islands, but you got this pirate nation or this group that just pillages and goes around sinking ships. And it's kind of like the Bermuda Triangle of this section. Mm -hmm. And this whole story about it being cursed waters and the god branching off the fact that anybody who goes into that land, doesn't that water doesn't come out because yeah. these people are already there. Sinking or everything. it's just a, or it's just a PR campaign by the pirates. Like, don't come here. Exactly, it's sacred. <laughs> propaganda. You, don't, you only, you only the, want to do it. You so only the want pirates know. are bought into the Paladin Order. <laughs> they could be even part of the freaking racket. Like that could be the thing. Like, all right, you chase us for a good, you know, a, a good few knots. Uh, or, or, like all some, right, some good you go to gear. your island. We'll go to ours. <laughs> <We're> yeah. <good>. Yeah. <laughs> There's yeah, two so, of them here. <laughs> Like, yeah, I mean, honestly, it could be the biggest racketeering job of all time. We get to raid the coasts in the local waters. You get to be heroes and get supplied by the local kingdoms to stop us. We sacrifice a few ships every now and then when we need bigger ones. And, uh, you know, when one of our captains is getting old and wants to go out on a glorious way, we can actually, like, mock fight each other. It's like that town that pretended to be a Wild West thing to keep away tourists. Yeah. Hilarious, by the way. So tell me, Funny. tell me this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something real quick, and I want you guys to tell me what you think of when I, when I say this. Yes. There is a patch of water over here, uh, on the left side of the map, that uh, it's almost like gravity has been reversed, and the water flows up into the sky. In like a huge column of water. But where does okay. it go? Like full reverse waterfall. Well, okay. Here, here's right. my here's my one question. What happens when the uh, boat full of humans sailed into it? Rip. <laughs> I got a thought. My first thought um, is not actually. It's my first thought is while it looks like like this weird magical, almost maybe even heavenly cosmic phenomena where gravity inverts and there's this like column of water for like maybe several, maybe like several miles wide. In reality, it's a really intense magic, like magic being held up by the ruler of this like secret empire of like, I don't know, I'm in my head, I have like crab people. Cause I like crab people for some reason. Like- you do Kuatoa. Yeah, exactly. That that's where I'm at in my head where it's just like the one time the human ship sailed through, like the story is like, they like went straight up to the kingdom of the gods and like were banished from like, from like, from what they saw. And like, they like, they were like scattered to like hell or something. That, that's the story. But the real story is they just went through it, met the crab people and got fucking murked. Like, <laughs> like I don't know. Like whenever I think of like, I, whenever I think of like incredible phenomena like that, I'm always, I always wonder like, okay, there's some, probably some really huge dogma around that. 
like what's the rig what's what's really there though like what can you do to kind of set that up because like that just made that's the kind of thing where like you could run one campaign where like you give them that like oh this is column of water over on the right and like just give them that just sit them on that for like three years of a campaign and then <laughs> after they've dealt with the first major big bad evil guy they've resolved the whole thing the kingdom is saved <laughs> crab people get fucked <laughs> like you just you could just do that. Like yeah. you could just do that. You know, it's the perfect time to strike. Well, uh, exactly. Like I, I don't know. Like I always think about like that's the kind of thing where I'm like I could give my 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 party my 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 audience whatever one story for this and let them sit on that for as long as I want and then secretly have something else brewing for however long as I want and then just okay. By the way, here's this thing. Hell, I can come up with that at the last second if I wanted to. Just like you know what, I need a new. Need new campaign hook because this current one's ending. What if the waterfall's taken and they're crab people? There we go. Boom. Yeah. I planned uh, this the it, whole it time, is. actually. You can, yeah. You can, you can set timers at any point in the world, even if your players, if your players in the current situation can't reasonably uh, address them, it's just going to add more conflict. You know, yeah. you could say, uh, "Oh yeah, there's a king, uh, three like you know, in, on the entire other side of the continent." And you just found documentation that proves in 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 five weeks he's to be assassinated. What do you do? You never met this guy. You have no reason to like this guy. You have no idea what's going on. You think there's a war over there? If you do a decent history check, and like he might be important to it, but maybe he's part of that one area where there's a bunch of kings and they all work together in some kind of council. But like these people certainly didn't like him, and we didn't like these people. We'll keep this on hold, and then they'll forget about it because they'll go in the bag of holding that you gave them because that's where you do. It. That's what you give them when you want them to forget about all the awesome magical loot you got. They have. And uh, bada bing, bada boom, that king gonna die. <laughs> the uh, the first thing I thought of uh, when when thinking about this, like, what if there was uh, this spout? Um, was the like the thoughts, the theory of like reverse Earth, and like um, there's this strong like gravitational energy that's holding all of the other water uh, that you can see towards the bottom. But for some reason, the gravitational energy has uh, is weak here, and so the flip side of the map, the water is pouring through this hole up into the sky on the other side. So all I'm gonna say is, Hollow Earth Kaiju Hunting Campaign when? <laughs> certainly. That's all. I'm, that's all I'm Absolutely saying. Absolutely certainly. Whichever one of you wants to run with that. I'm just saying. <laughs> or Donut World. Oh, Drop, okay. Dropping, just dropping that one in the park and walking away. <laughs> no, it's a great idea. Um, so, Meg, uh, jumping back into our question, what are, what are some of the systems that you've used, if you or have heard about, and been interested in playing? If um, any. Ones I have been interested in playing or running. Yeah. Um, I've been leaning into sci-fi a lot. That hmm. I wonder why. Um, I, could, I couldn't guess. I could not really, guess. Truly. Could not guess at all. Um, I actually really want to run Mothership for myself. Um, I want to run that at some point uh, because it was a great experience playing it. But I want to actually run a rules light -like game for myself because the systems I've run have been clunky. So. Uh, that's something that I would love to do. Uh, Enter the Survival Horror is one that I took a peek at that was brought up when the um, Resident Evil Catalyst game was brought up. That one's actually completely based off Resident Evil, but it works for just about any like actual survival horror. You could do like a haunted house, um, which is something that I also want to lean into is doing something that's more paranormal, but... I find that I am not as versed in TTRPGs, so I'm still finding things that I kind of want to do and uh, play around with. I just bought, I just got, I got that Twitch bundle, not that Twitch bundle, the Humble bundle, or Itch, whatever mm -hmm. it was, the one that had like a thousand it's systems your, in it's it. Itch or Twitch or one it of the names something. that so, sounds a little dirty when you say it. Yeah. The, the one that had uh, like a thousand little one shot, little. Um, TTRPGs in it. I'm going to filter through that at some point, and I'll mm. probably find something I want to run in there. But. 
that's yeah oh my gosh because here's the thing we, we, we've obviously uh because i saw a proper jump of the chat here uh we have talked about generational and uh and um the quiet year and, and and just obviously there's a ton of systems out there so it's really whatever group wants to i can say from personal experience i've enjoyed doing stuff like this where you just kind of like can sit someone down for like 10 minutes of their day and be like hey tell me about this section of the world they're like that's a mountain like yes it is who <laughs> lives up there nobody why just you just put them through the socratic yeah. method and like you let them tell the story uh until they just basically cry um <laughs> but in order to avoid that there's also some other resources uh that i've personally enjoyed uh, i know dawn of worlds is a game that i really like uh where every player is responsible as a deity um oh. and and uh takes turns collecting power and influencing the world um either by like making heroes making peoples raising mountains creating oceans stuff like that um and like back it's a great way to instantly get players bought in you know because if it's one thing if like oh hey i helped come up with a concept of the god of fire and creation it's like no i was the god of fire and creation and that i know me. exactly i, I know exactly the thought process why he gave the dwarves magma mustaches <laughs> because it was funny damn it because it looked <laughs> bad <laughs> it is well, not a mark of honor you fool it's a cruel joke um and so like doing stuff like that's been really fun i honestly really do like the god games type stuff because it lets players be focused in their creation but also allows a lot of uh options for everyone else because like the mm. god of knowledge could like create a race of people that's only true purpose is to collect the all the knowledge of the world and like they just live all in one city, which is a giant tower. Uh, it houses all of the knowledge that's ever been recorded ever. And they send people out into the world to learn about it. Or you could, and then like someone can come around and be like, hey, I have enough points. That the whole building you built, it's on fire. It's on fire now. I, bur I burned the shit out of it. It's, I, it's burned. I burned it. Now your people are without cause. What will they do? You've ruined them, you fool. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think. Uh, uh, that's uh, there's a bunch of stuff uh, companions tale where you're telling you're exploring a land and uh telling it uh all about stuff and like uh, but it's from the perspective of the hero's sidekicks that are following him around uh microscope is a really good one which is also very free, much more free for me um but really if, if you just look into it there are so many uh however uh we do have another panel coming up and i know fox you have to jump over there really quick so i will leave you uh, i'll ask you to give us uh your final thoughts around uh just one more question of course with one more question mm -hmm. uh what what is one detail for a people, culture, place, anything you're working on within your world that you really need to cement before you feel it's even close to being done? Oh, before my world is done, I absolutely need to know uh, central tensions. And what I mean by that is like, I don't need to just know what are the major groups of peoples that are in this place. I don't just need to know what groups they're sorted into and what they believe. I don't just need to know that. I need to know what beliefs, what histories, what situations, what conflicts, what disasters, what anything is causing the story in my world. I have to know that before I know anything else, before I can call my world done. I don't care if I have the most expanding world with, every, with 30 different cultures that are all just with their own pantheons of gods and histories of rulers and languages. I don't care if I have all of that. If they just exist in a world and aren't doing anything, I have nothing. I just have cultures. I just have a sandbox. When I say, okay, well, the elves with their long and proud history of swordsmanship and tradition, they developed that through a history, through a super long war with the dwarves who developed their, their, their long line of like siege tech and, and great artifices by that war, you know, because I, if I haven't done that, if I haven't set to hit, hit that step yet, my world isn't done. I need to get that yet because those are kind of those are the kind of things that are gonna make my players, again, have things to hook on to. Like if, if my player says, "Hey, um, I want to join your homebrew campaign. I want to play an elf. What's happening with elves in your world?" If I just say, "Oh yeah, well they're really cool swordsmen who live in the forests," okay, that's that's great, I guess. But and I could leave that open for the player. But if I say, 
Well, yeah, they're swordsmen who live in the forest and have a long history of fighting in, uh, in skirmishes from the dwarves. So they have this ancient hatred run from the war they fought 400 years ago, which led them to develop these like long uh, martial cultures wherein the, the greatest swordsmen are, are the leaders of their nation. Like, if I can say all that, that's tension now. That that's something that I, I can my players can hook themselves into. Now they know who an elf is, and they can they decide like who their elf is based on that. So I have to have central theological like central tensions in my world before I know my world is done. I have to have that. Uh, that's all I got. But like Turk said, I gotta hop on over to the next panel that I'm doing, uh, which is in like half an hour. So if you want to see my face some more, stay tuned for being on the Unites yes, Roleplay. You guys be- are great though, and I love you all so much. Okay. We love you as well, and we hope you have a fantastic panel. Of course, we already know, and we'll be jumping in. Uh, I'm going to come in as uh, this mobile, so we, we all should be set up, and uh, you're he- good to head out. Bye, babies. I love you all. Bye. Bye. I love you. All right. We're all Perfect. still set up on layout. Perfect. Excellent. Okay. So, uh, gosh. Uh, I think uh, I'll jump in with something that I've recently added because we've been having this kind of, I feel like we, no one's really touched on it, but Meg, you brought up, you asked a question, like what happened with this area here? And uh, I just kind of started a sentence and didn't know where it'd go. I knew there, I like the idea of a magic, of a plague or a war being associated with it because, you know, that, because we were kind of talking about earlier with when Ty mm-hmm. was talking about the uh, effects of World War I on, on the Belgian agriculture and landscape, that's actually completely shifted um because there's so many gosh dang trenches uh but uh thinking about that i was just like it used to be a fertile land obviously it's a big swath of that deserty stuff but something happened that this whole entire land is now dead after the end of the great war and the death of the furbolg empire don't ask me why i put furbolgs but i did and now it's a fact now that's just it man uh it's it's like the furbolgs had an empire now I guess they can be more furbolgy as people dish- traditionally assume them to be. It could be furbolg in the more traditional sense of the word, which is to well, say let's, people of let's, the north. Let's go off of uh, let's go off of pre-established furbolg lore. Furbolgs are uh, established protectors of dense forest and forest life. So there was this furbolg empire that was trying to do whatever they possibly could to preserve the natural order of things and and forest life and uh i'm gonna say uh that they tried to they tried to wipe out all the humanoids on the planet i love it because because like they're they're they're, (laughs) you know they're trying to protect the natural order of things and who fucks up the planet more than us (laughs) Mm -hmm. so the only thing that got these uh, four nations here uh, that were take, uh, together to actually address a problem. <laughs> and, or or, or uh, they started doing that and that displeased the gods so much that they just, you know, nope. ruined them. And so now that area here, because it's all just dun- jungles and deserts, could be the area where a lot of adventures take place. Going mm-hmm. through the old ruins of the kobolds and their the kobolds, furbolgs, and their uh, advanced uh, technologies when they were uh, the kind of advanced naturalistic technologies. We can almost be like, uh, you know, and now I'm thinking because this is kind of if it was like a futuristic, uh, a futuristic uh, technology, but also bio- biological. I'm almost thinking like, like aliens, like xenomorph hives, mm-hmm. for kind of thing where everything's kind of just like musculature opens doors and stuff where it's just like the roots of the world like it's gross but like it's nature so it's you know Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's gross but it's cool it's nature it's fine yeah man. it's organic i mean (laughs) it's organic yeah you know if you don't have a horrendous uh a horrendous way to open your doors making them seem as if like a sphincter then store bots fine (laughs) Uh... (laughs) um awesome um I think I think that's a cool cool thing though, um, because one, this landmass doesn't belong to any of the empires, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but two, there are there are established uh, port cities on the mm-hmm. southern southern edge there. So those that kind of tells me that like there is an effort by some some sort of entity uh, or empire to colonize this this land. Um, it's not 
claimed, but I do think that there is uh, like little pockets of, of colonization, kind of like in the Americas. Yes. Oh, no. And then there's definitely a, as maybe you said about like just uh, figuring out like, do you, because here's the thing if, if we're talking about like working with their players before, uh, and like you don't necessarily have to be fighting bad guys, these could be recently established cities. This yeah. could be, hey, help us explore the, the the wastes of the Furborg Empire. You know, no one's been here for centuries. And, you know, we all we know is that no one's be able to get a bunch of Furborgs together again. Like, because maybe they're plagued by the gods. If they collect in too large of a group, they'll be smite it, smote or something. Um, <laughs> or, I mean, you can even start it with sending these people to actually colonize these spots. Exactly. Like, you've got... Okay, we've got Confederacy. Okay, we want to put something here and maybe see what's going on on these islands. Mm, you get your spies there. Get your spies it's, going it, on. They can have run-ins with the pirates. Here's 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 what I really like. There's a concept like the legation cities uh, in, in China. These kind of international ports uh, where you could just, you know, anyone from any of the European world because of colonialism and, you know, harsh uh, opium wars, but, you know, our history is marked with blood. Why shouldn't this world? Um, and um, it, it was kind of this idea that like, we're just going to like let a company run this and they'll kind of explore and run handle diplomacy. And anyone who accepts this company's rightful claim can operate here. So this could be like two major trading hubs because I mean, the kingdom man has got to go all the way around the port there if they want to do a sea route to these other empires and if they're being respectful to the dead god uh so or they can stick close to the to the coast here and then after that long journey if you're staying close to the coast well you got to stop somewhere yeah so you have these two big port cities and this could be a hub of not just trade but information because like you said this could be a great spot if you're if you're from the confederacy or or the republic and just like send them in and uh hey we want you to find out uh, why there's a whole there's been increased shipments from uh, these uh, these isolated uh, areas out here. You know, there's been some ships sailing out that direction. Go find out what's going on. And to that like, point, I do think there's probably a pretty large, uh, like port metropolis here in this desertous area, where mm. it's a lot easier for the kingdom of Ma kingdom of man to make it to this desertous area um, to kind of conduct land route train, right? Mm -hmm. So they have the longer, probably safer uh, routes via the sea. Um, but then they also have this land route where it's like, okay, it's going to be shorter, but also we're traveling through this, this magic plague stricken uh, land with all of these terrifying creatures and uh maybe maybe even crazed fear fear bulbs and you have to go through all of this before you can get to the first kingdom of however many mm -hmm. so no i i exactly and and here that's a great thing because travel is a great way to help define your world and the general theme of it because i mean if you step out of a city is that dangerous uh, oftentimes with adventuring that's kind of the assumption mm -hmm. is that you know going beyond the walls of a place is is dangerous and there's unknowns um and so of course like is is is, is that going to be dangerous or is this area safe to travel the roads are there guard patrols in this area how is how does that like affect how your players move about well it means it's hard to get a random encounter that's not, uh, is teleportation an option? Another great thing. How established is magic in this world? Something we haven't really touched on. Obviously, yeah. there's How some form of- How industrialized is it? Are there train routes? Yes. Like... yes. One of my favorite world facts, uh, it's not really a fun fact, but it's kind of a historical thing because there's an area that I said was like the three kingdoms the period. I had an event called the, uh, oh gosh, the I, I have it written down. I'm trying to find the right words. Um, the Exodus of the Magi where basically at the start of the war, the Magic Council got together and was just like, hey, uh, this is going to get real fucked if we start taking sides. So we're just going to kind of go. And they took the, four, the, the fourth son, uh, one of the four sons of the, of the king was like, 
Yeah, I'm kind of the head, and I don't like any of the direction this is going. We're, I'm just going to take my own city. All of our us magic users are going to go there, and so mm -hmm. all these other nations are dealing with like, oh shit! All of our really well practiced wizards and, and sorcerers they're just gone now. We have to make do with what we got, and it's like how each nation is approaching yeah. how they're bringing magic back in is going to redefine uh, redefine them, and especially as they gain ground over the others. Uh, mm. You know what's going to happen when this little offshoot of magical world? Like, are they going to remain neutral? Or are they yeah. going to pick a side? I had a uh, I had a world that I built that was based around um, based around magic and the stewardship of magic. The entire world was based around, um, and what ended up what i ended up creating was this world that uh divine magic was encouraged and uh gifted to people and then there were sects of uh like learned magic um and every other source of magic uh the the users were hunted down and captured because it was the source of wild unknown almost like uh, like demonic gifted uh source of energy and so i think it's i think it's interesting not necessarily on that scale but if you were to have uh, a country an entire country that the the use of magic was watched uh and the stewardship of magic was very specifically uh like a big part of this country like there was this magical cataclysm in the past in this country these people want to make sure that they are not responsible for the next big cataclysm so they hold their uh you know their magical casters have to be trained in a very specific way and there can only be so many and if you're caught using magic uh without permission then you're you're going to be in big trouble kind of thing so it's interesting uh, i think there was a, a question of like can you teleport around to all of these different places and honestly because of how all of these countries are kind of like built out i don't think you can i think there's there's regulation of magic and the use of magic for travel uh throughout these different countries like you can probably do it within your own but it's very much like um it's very much like getting a flight to a different country here and uh here on earth right you have to have a passport you have to have permission to do so so like a diplomatic uh ring magical ring that allows you to bypass like a, a mass forbiddance spell that's cast on large uh areas of these countries would be interesting so then would those people have like a lot of sway in the government would they be the heads of government like I do think that it probably uh, a lot of these governments are probably headed by um, magical users, or at least there's uh, divisions of the government that ha there has to be some sort of affiliation uh, of these arcane magical practitioners with the government. I don't know if that's going to be the government itself, so like a, a magic autocracy or something like that or if it's more of a in conjunction with so you have like king arthur and merlin and merlin's overseeing all of the all of the the magical shit or it's even something like the united states where you know there's the executive branch and that would be the king and everything blah 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 and then you have uh the judicial branch which is all of the magic uh so there's a lot of different ways that you can build out your countries that the politics themselves will influence travel and how your people live. And... Well, that is mm -hmm. that is politics. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's 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 just who who gets to make the rules, who's got the biggest stick. Yeah. Um, and I, I feel like a good example you guys you could look to if you are you know concerned about oh how do I handle magic in my world? What is what is the jurisdiction going to be like? Uh, you could look at all of the fantastic work that's been coming out uh, surrounding superheroes and superpowers and making them more realistic and gritty and kind of checking into that. Uh, I mean, uh, as a tyrant's point, it's very interesting when a country is trying to be a magical. Uh, like, uh, there could be I'm, I'm trying to think and putting on this map and, and but I'm, I'm, I'm immediately thinking of uh, 
my my own world but there, there could be like uh so we i have marked as this small area right here uh right here in the middle and so that could be like a heavily militarized rump nation because everyone loves a good dangerous tiny kingdom that will posture and you know fight to the death um that has uh completely given up on uh divine magic something they, they are like a break off from the three confederation the three nations here that kind of make up the world they were this was originally kind of like a compromised land and uh they're basically just like saw the horrors of what the gods did and they're just like ah yeah fuck that any <laughs> decent god would never do this we don't like you anymore like and so they just sworn off and, and so they're just kind of this little rump nation of militant atheists uh, who might not necessarily be declaring war on everybody, but certainly are like, uh, you know, going to sit on their porch with a gun and be like, you know, you, you best keep your prophetas and elsewhere. Uh, <laughs> sorry to go to the hillbilly accent there. That's not entirely fair to them, but, uh, you know, it is it is just an interesting thought. And I feel like... Uh, not to not to cut us off because I feel like we could just sit here till the cows come home, just keeping that uh, southern twang. But um, I, we are getting close to the end of our allotted time, so I guess we'll start. Uh, I'll, I'm sorry if I start with this last round, of, this last question that I asked Foxy, oh, um, and then we'll do outros because for me, like personally, uh, and I think it's because I really started my world building when I was taking a course on uh, religion and music. And, and, and art um i need to like find a song that gets me thinking about that place not just because it helps me when i'm actually writing it to like listen to it you know but i feel like it can really help just to find like a cool song and just be like i want this to be important to someone in this world for instance uh i you know can't tell you how i stumbled upon uh the ukrainian anarchist anthem uh mother anarchy loves her sons but I can tell you now that in my world, uh, there is a part of it um, that is basically like a Russian, like it's a, it's a very snowy Russian equivalent. Um, and uh, the people there don't necessarily worship, uh, a, they, they kind of worship Mother Anarchy, who isn't a bad or a good goddess. It's just the goddess that is. Mother Anarchy, as long as you're not going to try and establish dominion over anyone and you let people be as they are, as long as they respect the same about you, who gives a shit? Just imagine a bunch of, and every time I listen to it, I can see like this big feasting hall and uh, they're all just getting drunk and doing, you know, uh, group. it's like a group communal and yet individualistic dance where you're allowed to do whatever you want, but there's a general, like you can fall into as much of a pattern as you like. And uh, there's a cool part of the song that starts like going slower and that's where, you know, if there's any new guests, they must join the circle. And, you know, it, it's kind of like the, the Prince of Egypt thing. And you must come to join the dance, you know, and then he gets the Moses dancing. Yeah, yeah, it's the best movie in the world. Um, and uh, kind of like this whole concept of like, yeah, no, we're a bunch of crazy people, but you have to be crazy to live here. None of the nature is cruel, but it's also kind because it's the only thing keeping us alive. And how do you balance that? Oh, it's just anarchy. Yeah. And, you know, the lyrics of the song are, you know, about uh, sneaking into your uh, enemy's barracks and slitting their throats with knives because uh, Mother Anarchy loves her sons. Mother Anarchy cannot be bought. Um, and uh, it's just like, hey, man, that's badass. Um, it's just like yeah my, uh, and, and so i basically i know exactly i know their dances i know their food i know their communal culture i know like what they wear i have envisioned an epic scene for them where they can like you know the party can be being pursued by some kingdom and they'll just like randomly show up and be like oh these guys are trying to capture you what a bunch of dicks you know you're you know you're in the uh, thovenland that's not allowed here <laughs> come on we're gonna bring you all to our feast hall we're not gonna kill any of you and then it's just like oh gosh um but uh but yeah no it's it's just uh it's just I, I need the music i need to know what these people sound like i mean you can find a bunch of cool stuff mongolian throat singing uh the baku uh, the baku i believe uh of some uh south american tribes 
and, and like the vocal intonations there, uh, Indonesians, uh, it's just, there's all these untapped uh, cultural music that you don't typically get. And then you can even go look at like the Epic of Gilgamesh that's sung and, and stuff way back in the human record. And you still just find like music is so critical to storytelling. And I just like, hey man, that's cool. Like Total War Three Kingdoms soundtrack. Yeah, I'm stealing that. Uh, the Queen of Crows, Two Steps from Hell. Yeah. Uh, uh, another um what, what's another one i did um literally a youtube video of uh someone doing a skyrim thing uh where they just it's literally like people throwing corpses into a pile <laughs> while singing uh, rise rise a roaring golden eagles has inspired a whole thing where there's an elven kingdom that got wiped out and now it's basically a kingdom of the undead where some dudes just kind of like planning to raise the entire kingdom uh to push out the invaders and it's like shit man that's awesome that's a big ass hook um and it's just like yeah you could do whatever you want just listen to music and let it inspire you whatever inspires you honestly you could just artwork can inspire you just let it take you away make your pinterest board cover your house in thumbtacks leave <laughs> no open space you might look crazy but the diagram will reveal everything um, <laughs> Just sticky notes and whiteboards everywhere. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, but uh, I throw it to whichever one of you wants to take it next, because. Uh, could you could you rephrase the question real quick? Sh sure. Uh, so, basically, uh, what it, when you're making a world, when you're making anything, when you're working on creating a setting for your players, what is one thing? you need to lock in before you feel your work is ever truly done done like or, or like you, you like need it's it, it, to be true it's never done because the story is continually yeah. being told but like i am satisfied with what i know about these people like i feel like i've made progress with these people because i have reached the spot um in terms of world building um Honestly, something that's very important to me that I need to have locked in before, like, okay, I can I can start moving forward and, like, I know exactly how this is going to kind of, I have a better idea of how this is going to pan out. Uh, what I have to lock in is the creation mythos and mm. whether or not, what, what the gods are like, if there are any, are they distant, are they walking among us? Um, I, I feel like a lot of a lot of my world building stems from um, from that. I mean, if there's going to be some sort of uh, cataclysmic, uh, and I keep using that word, um, but if but there's going to be like some sort world, of- it's fine. Yeah, I know. Uh, if there's gonna be some sort of uh, creation mythos that does this huge event, how is the world going to be affected by that? Mm. I, I, and I, I truly, I need to know what I'm working with in the sense of like these, these beings, whether they be titans or gods or nothing, it could, there could be, there could be no gods. And how would the world progress naturally because of that? Um, I need to know what I'm working with and what I plan on doing for this specific campaign um, or the specific world in general, right? Um, so that I can inform the geography, so that I can form the culture, and how the cities would be laid out. Mm. Is there, is there, you know, no water for some reason, or are there just massive mountain ranges, or is it just normal? Yeah, you know? yeah. I, I need, I need to know these things before I can really move forward gotcha. from from that. Right. All right. So the doorbell does mean we're running low on time. So Meg, I'm going to ask, have you answer that same question, but also have it be a part of your outro, which of yeah. course means you have to improv sing it. Oh, shit. Or not. I'm not doing that. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Where's the shot? So, I can't sing. I refuse. Um, but my thing I have to have done before I feel like the world is complete enough to bring people into it is establishing the religion and how people view it whether that's by region um individual just overall because i've found that even in 
real life, um, religion shapes a lot of things. So you have America because Protestants didn't want to be in England. They didn't want to. They didn't want to ha- be forced to change their religion. That's kind of how it went. Uh, religion inadvertently shapes a lot of things. Um, and personally, I lean into the pantheon because I'm Hellenistic. So, um, <laughs> but uh, so that's kind of my thing because I think it really shapes the culture and how people perceive things. Um, but that's going to be it for me. Um, I am Meg Mysteria. This is the last you're going to see of me today. Uh, mm. you can, I know it's sad, but I am tired. I need a nap. <laughs> but uh, you guys can find me on my personal Twitch uh, as well as Twitter under... There we go. There's the SO. Um, mm. As far as that goes, that's that's really it. I've been going back and forth between Alien Isolation and Resident Evil Zero on my Twitch, so if you're interested in either of those things while I continue to be a fucking nerd about them, come hop in or um, hang around and see me in uh, God King's Calling, in His Divine Name, all those great things here on TPK and on Neon Lights. Um, other than that, we'll send it... Who, pop. Mm, oh, the tie, I'll close it say, <laughs> Send it to tie. Hello everyone, I'm Tyrant. Uh, you can find me on Twitch and Twitter at Dr. Tyrant. Um, I will be in three more TPKCon panels uh, over the next couple of days, so definitely keep coming back and watching that. I will be in the Iron DM as a uh, as a judge tomorrow morning at uh, I think 11 CST, like 9 PST? I don't know. I don't know the times. Check the calendar. Um, yes, check the calendar because we have a lot of we have a lot of stuff coming up in the next couple of days. Yes. Um, I will be doing. I will be running my own panel, uh, which is uh, kind of a playing for TPK panel and what that's like. There could be tips and tricks that come out of that, and just getting a general sentiment uh, from some awesome people. Um, and then uh, on Sunday, I will be joining Sir Heckalot to talk about um, animals and homebrewing beasts and creatures in, uh, in games. And it's going to be really cool. Very excited to kind of take that newfound love for homebrewing uh, and bring that to the more scientific side of things. Uh, it'll be really interesting to talk to Heck about that. So oh, yeah. I'm excited. All right. Um, and of course, hi, everyone. I am Turk or Turk Accented. I've been very glad to have these amazing people on my panel to talk about this. Uh, big shout out to TBK for greenlighting it and letting me take up the screens. If anyone's interested at all in uh, continuing to use this map or build off of it, uh, I can cer- will certainly uh, get this saved and uh, sent over to you. If Again, if anyone here wants to use it and continue to build off it, I'm sure. I mean, that's what it's all about. But the, proof it, the truth is anyone can do it. <laughs> Uh, it's not some unlearnable skill. Uh, it's just storytelling like anything else. And uh, I hope today you've learned a little bit about other people's processes, being able to recognize that some of your own thoughts coming into it were already valid and expandable upon, and that uh, you're capable of amazing and great things. I'll be around. Uh, just keep it locked wherever. Uh, and uh, we'll see you next time. But we're going to jump over to uh, Neon Lights to hear about some story of justice. They are going to do an amazing job. And of course, Fox is there, which makes it amazing right out the gate. Uh, but yeah, love all your faces and we'll uh, keep it locked here to TPK. And Neon Lights, but you know, also TPK. Bye. Bye, guys.